first lesson in this new unit introduces some basic probability concepts, specifically sample spaces, tree diagrams, and classical probability. So we're going to start with some definitions. Basically, for definitions, I want you to understand them in context, so they're going to come up later in this unit. It is important that you know and understand these definitions, but I'm never going to ask you them as test questions to find this word. So it is important for you to write these in your notes, possibly, if they're things that you have trouble remembering. But as long as you understand them in context, really they'll be smaller parts of larger problems. So in general, a trial or probability experiment is any process with a result determined by chance. Some examples would be flipping a coin could be a probability experiment. Turning on some chemical under a Bunsen burner and seeing how many seconds until it boils could be a probability experiment. You can phrase things a lot of different ways. The key thing is that chance determines the result. The outcome is each possible result for a trial. So the possible results for my turning on the Bunsen burner could be it boils in one second, it boils in two seconds, all the way up to it never boils. So I can list all the possibilities out if I had infinite time, but normally you have something simple like flipping a coin where the outcomes are either heads or tails, and those are the only two possible outcomes. Or as we look in future slides, we're going to talk about rolling a six-sided die and what the possible outcomes are there. The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes for a trial, and an event is a subset of outcomes from the sample space. So when I talk about a subset of outcomes, for my Bunsen burner example, a subset would be, say, boiling in under two minutes. And that would include all the numbers less than two minutes. If we rolled a single die, so we have a regular die that you use for any board game, Monopoly, that kind of thing. It's labeled one, two, three, four, five, six on the six different sides of the die. If we do one trial with the die, what that really means is we pick up the die, we roll it, whatever we get, we record, and that's the outcome of the trial. So an outcome could be, for instance, the die landed on the three. How could we define the sample space for this experiment? So the sample space should be every possible outcome. Here we saw one possible outcome is landing on the three. All the possible outcomes are really listed up here. Any of these numbers could be rolled. So in the sample space, we're going to put this brace, which is part of set notation. List 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then a brace to end it. I will say that sometimes when you're starting to get used to how to enter things in in this unit, things are going to be frustrating. Using the math type in order to get subscripts and have the answers match what they want is going to cause some confusion when you first do these homework sets. So don't be afraid to use the Ask Your Teacher. But just understand that you do want to get down their formatting because I'm choosing questions from the homeworks to put on the tests. So work through it, make sure you understand how they want these answered, but it is a little confusing how to use subscripts and such when you're answering these questions. That said, here we're going through some possible simple events and trying to find what numbers in the sample space would count for that. So if we had the event, roll an even number and that was our event marked A. What things in the sample space would count as rolling an even number? Well, two is even, four is even, and six is even. So within this event, I'd write two, comma, four, comma, six. Event B is roll a number less than five. For less than five, it's these numbers. So I would include one, two, three, and four in the event rolling less than a five. For roll a number divisible by 3, that would include 3 and 6, so those would be listed in divisible by 3. And finally, the event roll of 4 only includes one thing, the 4. It's possible you could make up an event that includes none of the things. If you, for instance, said what's the probability, or I'm sorry, what events in the sample space count as rolling more than a 10? Well, none of them do. It's possible that you have an empty set here. It's also possible that you have something that includes all the numbers. If you said what's the, what numbers that, or what events in the sample space count as rolling less than a 10? Well, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 would all count. So really what these events are bounded by, at most it includes everything in the sample space, 
at least it includes nothing in the sample space. Here are those done out, what different events from the sample space fit into these defined events. So again, this is how the answer would be written if I was trying to type it in the same gauge. In classical probability, if all the outcomes were equally likely, which is a big if, we're definitely going to do most of the stuff within this unit in situations where everything is not equally likely. So that's an assumption that we have when we're rolling the die, that it's a fair die, any of them could come up just as likely as the others. When we flip a coin, it's a fair coin, either side can come up as likely as the others. But there's many, many things in probability theory that do not rely on equally likely events. That said, where we're starting is with the easiest type of thing, which is these equally likely events. In that case, if we want to find probability by the classical method, basically we take how many events fit into the sample, fit into the event in question. So probability of E could be probability of getting an even number. This is how many things fit into it being an even number. So really when I say how many, if an even number would be numbers two, three, or I'm sorry, two, four, and six, three is the N of E. How many things fit into being an even number? N of S means how many elements are there in the sample space? We know in the sample space there's one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if we tried to find the probability of even, it would be three of the events count out of six of the events total. If I put that in my calculator, three divided by six would give me 0.5 saying there's a 50-50 chance we roll an even number. So basically we're dividing the number of outcomes that fit our event by the total number of possible outcomes. So roll an even number, two, four, and six count out of the six possible outcomes. Three divided by six gives me 0.5. When I'm rolling a number less than five, there's four things that fit. Four out of the six possible outcomes would reduce to two-thirds or 0.67. Roll a number divisible by 3 has two possible outcomes. So I take those two events out of the 6 total. 2 divided by 6 reduces to 1 third, or 0 0.33. Finally, if I am trying to roll a 4, that's only 1 out of the 6 things. 1 out of 6 reduces to 0.17. So here is each of those showing the division, where it's how many things fit within the event. Here we have three elements that fit, that's why three is the top. Here we have four, that's why four is the top. Here we have two, that's why two is the top. And here we just have one, that's why one's the top. Each time it's out of a whole sample space, so each of these fractions is out of six, because that's how many things are in the fully listed out sample space. Each time you try and reduce the fraction, which can be done in each of these, a reduced fraction will be marked correct, or you can put in your calculator and get it in decimal form. Just make sure that you're rounding it to whatever they're asking for for rounding. So we will have to understand a number of different terms. We're going to go over them here loosely. You're going to see some of them used. We're going to go over them again in 4.4. Basically, this is just a soft introduction to their ideas. So where we're going to begin is with the intersection. It can be referred to as A intersect B, A with a little upside down U B, or A and B. Really what it means is that both event A and event B must be happening at the same time in order for this to be true. If one or the other is happening, it does not count as the intersection happening. It only counts as an end statement if both things are happening at once. So if you say, what's the probability that somebody in the classroom is a female and wearing glasses? Doesn't count if they're just a female without glasses. Doesn't count if they're a male with glasses. It's only female with glasses that counts towards that probability. Has to satisfy both the first and the second event. So in that case, A and B would be, A would be student is female, B would be student is wearing glasses. To satisfy the intersection or A and B, they would have to be both. To satisfy the union, it can be one or either or both. So if I said, what's the probability that a student in my classroom is female or wearing glasses? You would count everyone who's female. You'd count everyone who's wearing glasses. You wouldn't want to double count anyone, so we're going to see a rule for that in a little bit, how we would 
make sure that the females wearing glasses aren't counted twice, but this is a more inclusive version. An end statement only counts if both are happening. An or statement or a union counts if one, the other, or both is occurring. Finally, the complement. It can be called A complement, not A, or A with this little C as the exponent. It includes everything in the sample space that's not A. So if I had all my students in front of me and I said, what's the complement of glasses? That would be anybody not wearing glasses. So if I knew the probability of somebody in the room wearing glasses, I could calculate what the probability of somebody not wearing glasses is by taking one minus that. Basically, that's the idea of the complement, is that it's everything else, where together they'd have to add to 100%. If I know 20% of my students are currently wearing glasses, I also know that 80% of my students are not currently wearing glasses. So that's just a general introduction. We're gonna see how some of these concepts apply in different situations. So this first situation we're gonna look at, we're given a sample space that says, here's all the events that can occur. Event one, two, three, four, five, and six. We count them as event A if it's event one, two, or three. We count them as event B if it's event one, three, or five. First thing we need to figure out is what counts as both A and B. A and B is an intersection question, so only events count if they appear in both lists. What appears in both lists is E1 and E3. So here, both A and B, I would list E1, E3. A or B or both. Well, in this case, I count everything in A, E1, E2, E3. I also count anything in B that wasn't in A. So I've already counted E1, I've already counted E3, but now E5 also counts. So if I was listing A or B or both, I'd list E1, E2, E3, E5. When I was listing not B, I'd want to look at B, and I'd want to compare that to the sample space. So in B, I have 1, 3, and 5, which means 1, 3, and 5 are already accounted for. The ones that aren't accounted for are 2, 4, and 6. So not B would include E2, E4, and E6, everything in the sample space that's not included in B. So there's those events listed out. I could then use these events to find probabilities by using the classical formula. Next concept we're going to talk about is a tree diagram. So a tree diagram basically allows you to better see what probabilities occur if there's going to be multiple experiments performed. So when I say multiple experiments performed, this tree diagram in the corner is showing what happens if I toss a coin three times in a row. Assuming it's a fair coin that only can come up heads or tails, here are all the possible ways it could end up. First, I could either go to heads or tails. Second, I could go to heads or tails off that first toss. And third, I can go to heads or tails off those first two tosses. The way I read this tree diagram is if I follow this top branch, I went heads, heads, heads. If I follow the next branch, I went heads, heads, tails. Heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, tails, tails. So basically, I can follow along any branch to see what the outcome was. You might think that heads, heads, tails is the same thing as heads, tails, heads. Both of them have two heads and one tails. But what listing it this way does is it allows me to answer probability questions like, What's the probability that I got heads the first two times? If I'm looking for getting heads the first two times, I would want to count this, but I would not want to count this. So even though these two have the same number of heads and tails, there's probability questions I could ask about order, which would lead them to having different answers, whether they qualified or did not qualify for a certain event. For that reason, I want to do out the full tree diagram to see all the possibilities here. That way I can write out each of them in my sample space, all the different ways that I could flip three coins. Here they are all written out, transcribed from this tree diagram. So it turns out that I have a listing of heads, 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 tails, heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, 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 heads, 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 
tails, heads, tails, 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 heads, tails, tails, tails. So here is my complete sample space. The general idea is when you're given a task like I flipped a coin three times, tell me all the possible outcomes, it's easier to start by making this tree diagram. You will be asked to create tree diagrams and at the very least recognize which one's correct within the system. You'll also be asked to create sample spaces from tree diagrams that you should be making in your notes in order to answer the questions. So if we use that tree diagram that creates this sample space, then we can answer questions like, what's the probability I get at least two heads? Well, at least two heads includes anything with two or three heads. So one, two, three, these all count, this does not, four, this counts, and these do not. So one, two, three, four of the outcomes out of eight possible outcomes means the probability is four divided by eight or 0.5. What's the probability I get exactly two heads? Well, exactly two heads wouldn't include three heads. So no longer is this counting, it only counts this outcome, this outcome, and this outcome. So it's three out of eight. Three out of eight would reduce to 0.375. What's the probability I get two heads in a row? Well, this has two heads in a row. It has it twice, really. This has two heads in a row. This does not, this does not. This has two heads in a row. No, no, no. So one, two, three outcomes out of the eight. Again, this would give me three divided by eight, or 0.375. What's the probability the first two tosses are heads? Only these two outcomes have the first two tosses being heads. So it's two out of the eight possibilities, which would give me 0.25 as a probability. Finally, what's the probability exactly one of the first two tosses is heads? Here, both their heads doesn't count. Both their heads doesn't count. Exactly one counts. Exactly one counts. Exactly one counts. Exactly one counts. Two tails does not count. Two tails does not count. So it was all four of these in the middle. It's still out of eight total. Four out of eight gives me 0.5. So here are those answers where it shows out which outcomes should be included in the probability calculation. Make a tree diagram for the following situation, then answer the probability questions that follow. The family has two children that are equally likely to be boys or girls. List the full sample space. So the first thing I would want to do is create my tree. In my tree, the branch for the first child, I'd have a branch that said girl, a branch that said boy. For the second child off of each of those would be another couple of branches. Girl, boy, girl, boy. I would then list the possible outcomes as I followed each branch. The topmost branch would be girl, girl, then girl, boy, then boy, girl, then boy, boy. So the sample space would include those four possible outcomes. Let me go back, sorry. Uh, actually, I'll show it to you guys when I'm doing these, just so you can see the sample space. Again, look how this is listed, where it's each one is parentheses, G comma G. I'm not sure that there's necessarily one in your homework set that has it exactly like this, but there's definitely ones where it lists the questions differently than how you assume. And I have a bunch of students who know the right answer, understand how the tree goes, but just don't know how to input it. If that happens for you, especially on this one question about yes and no answers, please send it as an ask your teacher and I can help you through it. That said, if we know this is our sample space, if I'm trying to find what's the probability they have two girls, well, that's only this outcome, girl, girl. Out of four possible outcomes, it's one out of 4.25. Exactly one girl includes these middle two outcomes, girl, boy, or boy, girl. That's two of the four outcomes, or 0.5. At least one girl includes girl, 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 boy, and boy, girl, which means it's three of the four outcomes are 0.75. Less than two boys is the same exact thing as at least one girl. Basically, it includes these three and does not include this one. So there's different ways to ask the same question, but each of these are three out of 4.75. 
Notice up here it shows the tree diagram where I go girl, 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 boy, boy, girl, boy, boy, and then here it lists what the outcomes are for the sample space.